So hi everyone and welcome to the lecture series beginning on the theory of market structure, which begins with a uh, perfect competition. Now for the past two uh, major uh, modules, we discussed the theory of the consumer and the theory of the firm. And when we get to the theory of market structures now, we now see how firms and uh, consumers will interact. So before we held the two constructs, uh, the two main economic agents in isolation, but when we get to market structures now, when we have this perception of what the market is, okay, we now bring these two economic agents together. And the first market structure that uh, we'll tackle is known as perfect competition. And... Perfect competition, if you ask anyone off the top of their head, uh, give me a market environment that's like perfect competition. Well, typically they'd say something like a wet market, uh, something like that, wherein you have stalls that roughly sell same products and uh, that charge roughly the same because there's hardly an incentive for them to deviate from something. So uh, in, the, in these um, next few videos, we're going to discuss the underpinnings behind perfect competition and we're going to see how uh, the assumptions in this market drive the eventual conclusions that we'll be, uh, that we'll be deriving to construct a very basic model okay, of uh, the interactions between market demand and market supply. Okay, so in order for us to understand perfect competition, we need to first see its assumptions and what those assumptions, what those different assumptions would try to entail. So in perfect competition, we have four main assumptions. So I numbered them each here. The first assumption is that under perfect competition, we assume that all firms produce a homogeneous or identical product. And we'll go even further to say that uh, firms in our discussion will just produce one product for the most part. So if you think about a wet market that only sells, for example, fish. So fish is a homogenous product, it's roughly identical. And um, you have different sellers, many, many sellers there that are selling the same good. Okay, and essentially, okay, from a seller's point of view, say a person selling a, a good or that homogenous product, consumers are also identical in that there are no advantages or disadvantages associated with selling to a particular consumer. I mean, the products are similar. So essentially, um, as, you, as we'll learn later, the price of those products will also be similar and it's determined by the market. So firms have no uh, capability to, to discriminate against uh, uh, pricing uh, higher or lower for certain levels of consumers in a perfectly competitive market. Second assumption that we have is that there are many, many, many buyers and sellers. So there are numerous buyers and sellers. And the sales or purchases of each individual unit, okay, say a buyer or a seller, are very small, okay, they're very small relative to the aggregate or market volume of transactions. What does that mean? It means that, say, a consumer opted not to consume something today or to decrease or increase his or her demand, it wouldn't really affect okay, the entire market demand because the, the value of each individual consumer, say just that one consumer, is very small relative to the whole market. So for example, say you had a market where in, there were a thousand buyers, the decision of one buyer will, will not heavily sway the entire uh, market's decision. Similar with a market wherein you have a thousand sellers. The decision of one seller, assuming they all sell the same product, will not really affect the market demand um, in that way. So that's uh, something to note. Assumption to states that there are numerous buyers and sellers. The third assumption, which is, you know, as you probably would see here, it's very unrealistic, right? And that both buyers okay, and sellers possess perfect information. Now, while it may be unrealistic, there are some cases wherein you know you could see this going on. Okay, and the what we assume is that since both buyers have perfect information, they have perfect information about the prevailing prices and the current bids. And since they have perfect information, okay, 
they take every advantage or every opportunity to increase profits respectively. For the case of a consumer, it's true too. The consumer has every information, okay, has every opportunity to be able to increase utility subject to prevalent market prices. Similar to a firm, since it knows its price, uh, the price that it should charge, they can uh, opt or take advantage or to create a mix where they could maximize their profits. The fourth assumption is that um, entry and exit from the market is free okay, for the consumers in the long run, for both consumers and firms in the long run. What does that mean? Well, uh, say the market wasn't, uh, it's not any more profitable from an economic standpoint, firms are free to leave and consumers are free to leave, to leave if they don't prefer that product anymore. So there's free movement along the market in the long run. Now, we need to try to get these assumptions um, uh, pinned down so that we can really understand how the theory of market structures and perfect competition goes. So let's break each assumption down carefully. Okay, so to the first assumption, again, the first assumption is that all firms produce a homogenous or identical product. Uh, it assures, okay, that first assumption ensures anonymity of firms and consumers. You cannot tell firms and consumers apart, okay? From a firm standpoint, okay, we have no, there are no uh, trademarks, okay? So there are no ways to differentiate firms. So there's no trademarks, no brand labels, no patents, whatever, so no form of brand protection or anything, no uh, intellectual property, nothing like that. Therefore, if those things don't exist, okay, consumers have no reason to prefer the product of one firm to that of another, right? So whichever firm he or she goes to, that's, what's, or that, that's the firm they would transact with because they sell the same products and, the, and that consumer has no incentive to go to a specific firm that would give him or her this service because all firms okay, are the same to their eyes. Now, from a consumer standpoint, okay, because of uniformity, okay, because, because of uniformity, what will do what will happen is uh the firm, okay, the firm will sell to the highest bidder. To the highest bidder. And what that means is that customary or institutional rules of thumb such as first come first serve are uh, are not necessarily followed okay so for example supply is constrained to some extent although it's highly unrealistic if it's a perfectly competitive market whichever consumer pays um, opts to pay the highest price say that was the case in a very unrealistic scenario the, the firm would give it to that consumer but you'll see that in a perfectly competitive market there's very little information on uh, there's very little incentive for people to deviate from uh, from market price because it's it's set by the actions of all consumers and all firms now that's for the first assumption the second assumption as i said is that there are numerous buyers and sellers okay so with many firms okay with many firms an individual firm can decrease or increase its output without any significant effect on the market price. What does that mean? It's the same as I said earlier. When there are so many firms in the market, say um, a million firms or a, a billion firms, there is no tangible impact when one firm, say, chooses to increase or decrease its production. There is no impact of that on the market price. Similarly, on the consumer's case, with many buyers, and say you have a thousand, a million buyers out there, an individual consumer may choose to decrease or increase her, her individual demand, and it wouldn't really affect the price. Again, it's just one consumer out of a million, a billion. So the decision of the consumer wouldn't matter as much. Okay, So it wouldn't influence the entire market price. So what happens is both individual firm an individual buyer acts as if they have no influence, so they behave as if they have no influence on the price. And what they do is they just merely adjust to what uh, the market situation is currently. So 
what happens is we can characterize both buyers and sellers as what we call price takers. Okay, so buyers are price takers in a sense that they adjust okay, the quantities that they buy such that the quantities will give them, okay, for a buyer, okay, your goal is to maximize utility, right? In the theory of consumer behavior, the goal of a consumer is to maximize utility. And they'll maximize utility given prevalent market conditions or market prices without ever considering that their purchases may in turn further affect the price. So a consumer okay, maximizes his or her own utility with no regard for their specific influence on market price. And to an extent, that's believable because if it's just one consumer's decision, okay, an individual consumer's decision, it's likely to, um, to affect the entire market price. Moreover, from a seller's point of view, from a seller's point of view, their goal is to maximize profit, okay? And the way that sellers maximize profit is that uh, they maximize profit taking into account what the market price is. So sellers take the market prices given. It has no control, same with the consumer. And they adjust the quantities that they sell such that the quantity that they produce, okay, is their profit maximizing quantity given that market price. Again, without considering for the fact that the quantity that they choose might affect the market price. So individual firms and uh, buyers have no concern about uh, how their individual decisions affect the market price because their individual decisions cannot affect the market price. Okay. Now, the third assumption is about perfect information. Okay, and it guarantees okay, perfect information on both sides of the market. So it means that buyers and sellers okay, produce, or I'm sorry, process complete information on the quality, the nature, and the prevailing price of the product. In that manner, okay, there is no incentive for cheating to occur. Or cheating is unrealistic. Why? Because buyers and sellers know exactly the market price. Okay? They know what something costs. Okay? And they know what to charge for it because it's given in the market. So... Uh, a seller has no uh, incentive to increase the price. Otherwise, the buyer would just go to another firm who would sell it for the market price. Similarly, for the buyers, they can choose any firm they want and they could get that same product assuming he or she knows the market price, within, which in this assumption, that's implied. Okay, So um, from a seller, they can't attempt to charge more than the prevailing price. Otherwise, consumers will move to another uh, firm. For consumers, they cannot buy at less than the prevailing price. Since the since everyone in the firm, okay, if you're a firm, just take the market price. No incentive for you to decrease that because we'll see later on, okay, if you opt to decrease, that will just push down the market price and eventually might lead you to negative returns. Now, what happens also is since the product okay, that's being sold in the market is homogenous and everyone has perfect information, both firms and sellers, a single price must prevail in the competitive market. Okay? Since it's homogenous, all the products are the same, okay? a single price must hold. And that's seen in many markets where uh, uh, firms in a perfectly competitive market will price match. In a sense that identical products must sell at identical prices. And we call that the law of one price. Again, that's when identical products must sell at identical prices. Okay, so uh, perfect information leads to little incentive to cheat and the law of one price. Now, fourth assumption, okay, again, it's uh, something to do with free movement in the long run. And the fourth assumption ensures that there is unrestricted flow of resources between alternative employments in the long run. What does that mean? It means that the resources a firm has okay, are always mobile and they move to which, uh, to which the market conditions are generally favorable or where the market conditions can give them the greatest return. What does that mean? In a sense, first, okay, firms can move to markets wherein they can make profits and leave those that they can incur losses. Say a market that they're in initially is making a profit, but eventually there's a big shock and um, there's little demand, so they incur losses. 
they are free to leave that market and venture into another market wherein they could possibly get a better return. Moreover, from a micro labor standpoint, labor, we know is an input in production, will be attracted to industries whose products are in great demand because that will give them greater returns. Okay, and we'll discuss more on, say, concepts like job security or productivity in some other time, but they're attracted to industries whose products are in great demand. Third, okay, inefficient firms are eliminated from the market or are replaced by efficient ones. Okay, so what does that mean? Say that a firm was in a market and even though the market is fairly well on the aggregate, the firm isn't doing well. Okay, the firm is free to exit the market. And what happens is the market will solve that problem that inefficient, inefficient firms will just leave the market because they have no incentive to stay. So they will opt to move to another market where they can potentially, okay, they can potentially have a higher return. So those are the main um, implications of the assumptions we had. Now, what do all these, these assumptions imply altogether? And I call that our golden implication, and it's simple. The market price and its magnitude, so how high or how low the market price is, is there, it's jointly determined, okay, jointly, by the actions of all buyers and all sellers. So the actions of all buyers represent market demand, and the actions of all sellers represent market supply. That's what I was saying earlier, an individual firm cannot do anything, but firms as a whole, the entire market's decision, if that's considered, will affect the price. So we consider the actions of all buyers and all sellers, not just one individual buyer or individual seller. So those are the assumptions that we have in the perfectly competitive market. And uh, what we'll do is we'll break down market demand and market supply in the next few videos to see how all of these links up with regards to perfect uh, competition.